Good morning, everyone. It sure is a wonderful joy to be with you today, and I'm very thankful for the invitation to share a few thoughts with you this morning on this holiday weekend. Let me begin with uh, two recent occurrences that are pretty close to home for me, at least close to my former home in Texas. Hurricane Harvey, as many of you probably already know, uh, was a devastating hurricane, a Category 4. Uh, within the first 24 hours, it rained one inch per hour. That means 24 inches or two feet of rain and continued on for upwards of 40 inches while the hurricane hovered over Houston. Almost 40,000 people had to leave their homes and find shelter. The, the federal relief only could manage about 10,000 of those, you know, capturing people from their homes and from flooded highways. More recently, just earlier this month, on a Sunday morning, much like this one, the Sutherland Springs Baptist Church, all 50 of them were in Sunday service when a lone young man came in and, and shot almost every one of them. 26 died, 20 others wounded. Now, this isn't... Uh, this is a heck of a way to start a Thanksgiving message, isn't it? And yet, for me, I think it's important not to hide behind just a, a gloss of Thanksgiving and to let's get real about it. Because churches all around this weekend are speaking about a particular scripture to be found in uh, the Christian scriptures from the book of Thessalonians that says something about giving thanks in all things. <laughs> it's challenging. And, you know, when I hear stories like these recent ones, I think to myself, thanks, I think. You know, but even more personally, I'm thinking about my dad. So my dad, who's going to be 88 years old next month, He's had some health challenges in recent years. He had a stroke. He was having spells where his blood pressure would just suddenly drop and he'd collapse. So what happened more recently on Thanksgiving night, as a matter of fact, my dad fell. He's been living on legs that really have less and less been working for him and he can't stand or walk unassisted any longer. But you know, he's very determined and he's very independent as best as he could be. Leaving my brother's house from Thanksgiving dinner, my, my dad slipped on the stairs and fell. He was pretty banged up. I remember the times talking to my dad when he's been in this state. I can hear across, you know, across the continent. I can hear, because they're in Philadelphia. My parents live in Philadelphia. I could hear in his voice his fright. And I can envision the times I've been with him during health challenges. I could almost see through the phone line his eyes penetrating mine and inquiring of me, am I going to be okay? So stories like these in Texas and more personal ones, you have your own stories. You know, they challenge us, do they not? in holiday times, really at any time. You know, we wonder where's the good in them, and we make up all kinds of ways to try to accommodate those stories and to find thanks. This is a very good thing about us humans and a great capacity of ours. Don't you agree? So this scripture from 1 Thessalonians, really, let me read the whole scripture to you. It's just a few words. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. You know, I want to talk about this today because 
You know, these stories, the two stories in Texas especially, were, were record-breaking, heart-breaking occurrences among the human family. I mean, they leave almost no one untouched. And yet, here's this, this thought that we are to rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all things. And not only that we're supposed to do that, but it's God's will. In other words, it's a requirement for us to do that. So I want to kind of break this down for us, because this book of Thessalonians, anybody know what a Thessalonian is? <laughs> you know, Thessalonians, this, this was a little, a little uh, community in the Jewish and Gentile world. This, this account of the book of Thessalonians purportedly written by the Apostle Paul to this community, was written about a generation after Jesus' life and death, right? Like 53 A.D. And it was written to this community for a reason. So this community was, uh, was trying to grasp the idea that was being taught just shortly after Jesus' death that Jesus would come again. The second coming was a big matter and a big hope on the minds and hearts of all of Jesus' followers. And this population were young followers. In other words, they were converts from Judaism or from Gentile faith traditions. And they were trying to grapple with, well, what's the, how do we wait and how do we find, you know, how do we find, how do we live in this state of uncertainty when we're being persecuted for our faith Aren't these themes that we're experiencing even yet today? This is the human, the human way. <laughs> but really, I'd like to kind of examine what those words say to us and what the tradition of Christianity has made them mean. Because it's helpful to examine that before we talk about how might we look at those thoughts today. And I certainly have some thoughts about them. Perhaps you do as well. So in reading some of the commentaries about this scripture, I, I really got the sense that one of the mandates of this scripture to give thanks in all things is to put up with things. Just put up with it. <laughs> Just deal with it, in other words, right? Tolerate it. And, and even importantly, suffer through Let's, we must suffer. We must suffer. There's a nobility in suffering that sort of runs through so much of the writings that we found from the early Christian population. You know, trying to do what Jesus did and suffer along with Jesus. That mentality that, uh, that is still popular today in many churches. And certainly, another theme that's really prevalent in, in the commentary is that you must always, no matter what's going on, always give thanks, because things could actually be worse. <laughs> and not only that, but that, you know, but, but your hardship, giving thanks because your hardship sort of leads you to God. I mean, how many times you go, you're in hardship and you finally think, well, I better pray now, <laughs> right? We don't pray when times are good. We pray when like, we're scared, right? We pray at those times. We must pray. So this idea that our hardships will send us to God, so to speak, is a prevalent idea. I like this one commentator, though, Ellicott, who says... Give thanks always, for God doesn't have any kind of a wish to cause you sorrow. In fact, we read this, he thinks we read the scripture wrongly, where it says this is, you know, to give thanks in all things, for this is God's will for you. He rather thinks it's more about it's God's will about you. It's God's will that you find reasons to be grateful. I like that. How about you? That's a lot better than then God says you must give thanks even when times are tough, even when things stink. But more that, you know, God would love it if you have reasons to be grateful all the time. 
Now, I don't subscribe to an anthropomorphic God or a God that's sort of made in my image, so I don't think about God that way these days, but I understand the tradition of Christianity sort of does. And of course, the major theme in the Christian scriptures is this theme of redemption, that Jesus died for us, and therefore, to do this in the name of Jesus was to, again, to suffer along with Jesus or to be redeemed by Jesus' sacrifice, and that God, in fact, gives us the happy and the sad, the tough and the, and the easy, God gives us those for God's purpose. That there's some reason, inexplicable to us humans, no doubt, but some reason why stuff happens. Thanks, I think. Jeez. Really, let me ask you, does anybody here really believe that everything is worthy of thanks? I mean, aren't some things just not right? Aren't some things good and some things not good? I, I'm going to tell you that, that in this business of the things I feel thankful for, you know, it doesn't include in my mind all circumstances. Mine does not include all. There are some things I could never say are or were good but I really don't believe that that's what the mandate is. I don't believe that's what we're being asked to do, or that that's some kind of religious command for us, is to make that kind of association between bad stuff and gratitude. I don't, I don't think that's it at all. I think I miss the mark when I think in those terms. Because really, that kind of, that kind of idea speaks of a belief system that I have been dispelling in my own awareness, and that no doubt it's a different belief system than what we teach week after week in, in unity. So that this idea that God has some specific reason for causing good and bad to happen, when we think of God like that, we're thinking of a God that's rather callous, don't you think? Often arbitrary. And that says something about that God that I'm not real excited about. How about you? I don't want that kind of God. I certainly don't want to believe that God is no more human than I am, or that that power that I subscribe to, that I am one with, and that I derive my identity from, that that power is just, you know, like me in my most only human mentality. That can't be. That can't be. And that God having a specific reason means that later we say, and I've heard it said a million times later, after all this bad stuff has happened, then we say, well, I'm thankful for all of it. You know, it was good that it happened because now, you know, now things are better for me. You know, would, would I have dispensed with the hard stuff if I could have gotten right to the good? I mean, who, who among us would, would willingly suffer hardship, loss of our special relationship, you know, the tough things in life, the death of our newborn, the horrible things that happen? Who would say they were good? But well, we tell ourselves a story because we have an ever-optimistic brain. This is the goodness of the, of the human capacity, is that we do have this capacity to make things mean what helps us to deal with them in a better way. Uh, but I'm of the mindset that says, I never will say that I'm thankful that this bad thing happened, but I will say that everything that happens is an opportunity for me to find where's the good, where is the good, and how to highlight, amplify, and bring forth the good. This is our natural capacity, our state of faith, our faith faculty at work. And maybe you recognize that for yourself. And of course, the last thing that I would dispel in this mindset uh, is, is that 
that the reason why suffering is good is because we get a reward later down the road, like post-death, <laughs> right? <laughs> that this heaven that is promised is an after-this-life kind of experience. And so lots of people think, let's just get rid of this life and let's just go to the goodies. I mean, really, if that's the promise, there'll be no veil of tears there. So why, why stay here? And yet, and yet, we're not allowed to kill ourselves, are we? We're not allowed. Suffering is noble because we'll be rewarded. Now, granted, I don't know where you sit with those as ideas or as, as beliefs that you hold, but I, for one, have found that there's serious problems with that kind of thinking that leads me to think of God in sort of a magical way rather than to find the power that is within all that God is for my life right now because really if unity teaches us anything, it's teaching us that there is only one power and that we could never be separate from all that God is. Are you with me? Do you hear this message? Are you with me in that alignment and understanding that there can be no separation? So if I make of God some kind of monster that causes bad things, what do I make of myself? So there's a few things that I would say that we could do to think Thanksgiving in a different way. And one is to become conscious absolutely of where good can be found in the midst of all things. And we do have that capacity and we use it every day. And I'm so encouraged as I've read in the aftermath of some of these awful things happening of just that capacity. So I tuned into CNN where a young man uh, who owned his own boat was about to launch that boat in the streets of Houston and to go save people. And the, the, the um, reporter asked him, really, like, so what are you going to do? He says, I'm going to go try to save some lives. I mean, he found that he had a capacity in the midst of that that terrible and frightful situation. He and, and thousands of other civilians took care of their own space, made sure their own property was in good shape, their families were safe, and then they took off in the middle of harm's way to save others. There's a good they found in the middle of that. There's the possibility of being in service. There's the possibility of feeling thankful that they had some kind of resources in order to support what was going on. I find that something to celebrate, and that's only one aspect of all the kinds of, of assistance that was brought to bear for the people who were in the greatest need during and after the hurricane. This is something we've come to expect and we've come to participate in our own ways as no doubt many of you gave of your money and other resources in order to be supportive. This is something to celebrate and here's where we find the good. We'll never say the hurricane was good. We will say that people helping other people is good and worthy of our thanks. Are you with me in that? In the aftermath of the, of the devastated little church in Sutherland Springs outside of San Antonio, the, the first thought was tear that church down. It's a, it's a horror, horror to just see it. You know, but the people that were left in the community around them gathered together. And as the, uh, as the um, what were they called? The, the, you know, the officers who were checking out the space, I forget their names, but you know, those that were making, sh that looking at the crime scene and sh securing, taking pictures, all that. As they were leaving, the community was coming in right behind it. And they removed all the pews that were just shot full of holes, for, uh, bullet holes. And they removed uh, all the stuff from the sanctuary. And they painted everything white, like pure, bright, bright white. The floors, the walls. They brought in, in handcrafted chairs, white chairs, placed 
of 26 of them for each of the deceased, put a beautiful rose on each one and engraved on in gold lettering the names of each of the deceased. They placed them around the periphery of this room so that the community could walk through. Why? They wanted to be reminded of life. They wanted to appreciate, give thanks for the lives of each of those beautiful beings that were a part of their community. They chose to find how to be thankful. I celebrate that, and I feel a great sense of thanks for the spirit of a community that could rise so swiftly to find their place of thanks in the midst of something that nobody could say was good. And my dad, you know, here's my dad. <laughs> you know, he's, he's in bad pain. He had an x-ray on his foot after this fall. He's banged up. He's always in pain, but now he's really, really in pain. I talked to him, and I say, well, Dad, tell me how it's going. Well, you know, the, fortunately the thing didn't break, but, you know, let me tell you about this project I'm working on. And he goes into great detail about this, um, this stained glass piece. He's an artist, and he's making a stained glass piece for someone who asked them to make a reproduction of their home. And he's like, I'm just not happy with that piece of glass. That color doesn't match the color on, that, on their house. I want it to be just right. And he's going on and on. He, he didn't care anything about like his physical body. He's got life to think about. He's got a passion to fulfill. He has a sense of purpose about him. And that is every day more important than the physical pain that he carries with him in this life. He is a living example to me of the animating power of divine life, and I give thanks for dad. I give thanks for that quality in my dad that I am learning for myself. So here's the second thought and my final one, <laughs> that really the whole key for me in in facing all situations, the wanted and the unwanted, the circumstance that I could be excited about and that that I wish had not happened, that through it all there is one thing to be thankful for, one thing every time, that we will find it in every situation, and that is what is inside of me to bring and to give that every day to know that no matter what's going on, I have every resource within me to be the light of the world for this time. You know, it reminds me of the scripture verse in um, John chapter 18 where Jesus answered the people who were questioning him, for this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. For this I have come. For this I have been born. What if the way we say thanks, I think, is, is that we get in the middle of every situation and our work to do is simply to figure out what is in me that I can contribute during this time. because that is the Christ consciousness demonstrated in our world. And that's where the thanks lies. The thanks lies that I've got a light in me. The thanks is that I know what I am. I know my nature. I know that I'm not separate from God. And so no matter what happens, it's never sent by some punishing or, or, or unpredictable God. It's always, always happening so that the light in me will rise to the occasion and that I I can be the light of the world right where I am. Is that something to be thankful about? You bet it is. Thank you, guys. Thank you.